We think of the Thai forest tradition as being such an integral part of Thai society. And we forget that it was very controversial when it started out. John Mun or John Sao were accused of not following Thai traditions, Thai customs, eating out of the bowl, living in the forest, being very strict about the vinya. And as John Mun would say, he wasn't interested in following Thai customs or Lao customs or customs of any country any society, because those are the customs of people with defilements. If you want to join the noble ones, he said, you have to learn how to live by their customs. So it's the noble ones that we honor. Remember when John Sua was setting up the monastery here? He kept saying, we're not trying to import Thai customs, and we're certainly not going to be trying to follow American customs. We have the example of our teachers, we have the example of the Vinaya and the Dhamma. And we follow that for our own sake. Now, if there are other people, he said, who like this practice, admire this practice, want to follow along with us, that's fine. We're happy to have them. But we're not going to go out of our way to draw people in, change things to please people. Because after all, when we do that, we're giving into our own defilements. So what are the customs of the noble ones? There are four listed in the canon, and there's one given in the commentaries. The one in the commentaries is the practice of going for alms. The story goes that when the Buddha went back to his home, the very first morning he went out for alms. Now the Members of the noble warrior caste did not go out for alms. So the Buddha's father saw him doing this, and he reprimanded him. He said, nobody in our tradition has ever done that. And the Buddha said, I no longer belong to the tradition of my family. I belong to the traditions of the noble ones. And this is one of the traditions. You go for alms. In the canon, they talk about three types of contentment. and one way of finding delight. The contentment is with food, clothing, and shelter. But it's not simply contentment. As the Buddha said, you see that there is danger even in being content. There's an element of pride possible. You have to watch out for that. You don't exalt yourself. You don't disparage others or the fact that they're less content than you are. You realize that each of the requisites has its proper uses. We chant them every night. We don't eat for play. We don't eat to put on bulk. We eat to keep this body going to, so we can practice. We wear just enough to keep the body covered and protected from the elements have enough shelter to keep ourselves protected from the elements, and enough medicine to ward off disease. That's it. That's plenty. But in the Customs of the Noble Ones, it doesn't mention medicine. The fourth one is learning to delight in abandoning and delight in developing. The Buddha talks about delight as being one of the causes for suffering. But in order to follow the path, you've got to learn how to delight in doing what the path requires. It's one of the elements of right effort, that you generate desire. Like right now, generate desire to get the mind into concentration. How do you do that? Instructions are given in the description of right mindfulness. To focus on the body in and of itself. Ardent, alert, mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. So right now you're fo focusing on the breath. And as for any thoughts that have to do with the world, you put them aside. And you bring three qualities to this exercise. The first is ardency. Of the three qualities, this is what makes it skillful. Ardency is the desire to do things really well. Alertness is watching what you're doing, 
And mindfulness is keeping things in mind. No alertness can be alert to anything you're doing at all, skillful or unskillful. Same with mindfulness. You can be mindful of all kinds of things. But when you're ardent, you're trying to do this well. You're trying to be mindful for the sake of concentration. And through the ardency, you try to be alert for the sake of concentration. You're mindful for the sake of concentration. This is probably why when John Lee was talking about these three qualities in his description of establishing a mindfulness, ardency was the quality that embodied discernment. Because there's a wisdom in realizing that the Buddha's teachings are not just to listen to or to think about or to argue about. They're here to put into practice, to train the mind. And in training the mind, you have to move it in directions it might not normally want to move. This is why it's good to learn how to delight in abandoning unskillful qualities and delight in developing skillful ones. Which is basically what ardency is all about. And that's how the customs and noble ones get brought into the practice. You don't just sit here watching things coming and going, whatever is going to come and go. When there's something unskillful in the mind, you don't say, well, I've just got to learn how to accept that. That's the way things are. If I try to put an end to it, that's a, that's a defilement, that's a desire. There's skillful desire on the path. That's what the ardency is all about. So work on this. And as you find, as your mindfulness gets more solid, you settle in. You learn how to breathe in a way that feels really comfortable. Breathe aware of the whole body. So the whole body feels nourished by the breath, refreshed by the breath. The mindfulness turns into concentration. Now there are people who are afraid of concentration. I don't know how many books on meditation start out with their mention of concentration, and the second sentence is you've got to watch out for it, you're going to get stuck. But the Buddha never taught that. After all, he taught right concentration. And as he said, you have to have right concentration if you're going to be able to pull yourself away from your other defilements. So it's okay to get stuck on concentration for the time being. Because if you don't have this to hold on to, you're going to go back to your old ways. Nobody killed anybody based on an attachment to concentration. They do kill one another based on their attachment to sensual pleasures, their attachment to any of the hindrances, except for sleepiness. So this is a safe attachment. You think of the Buddha's image of the path as being like a series of relay chariots. When you're riding in a relay chariot, you've got to hold on to hold on to the breath. And when the breath gets comfortable, hold on to that. And don't just hold on, though. Be wise in how you use that sense of comfort. And John Lee talks about this. He says if you get a coconut and you break it open to eat it, that's it. You get full of one coconut, but that doesn't keep you full for very long. But if you take the coconut and plant it, then after a while you get a coconut tree and that'll give you more coconuts, and you plant those coconuts, and eventually you become a millionaire with a coconut orchard. In other words, you take the sense of ease that comes with the breath and you develop it. You talk to yourself, well, how do I maintain this? How do I let it spread around the body? And then you realize talking to yourself becomes a disturbance because the breath feels full throughout the body, so you can stop that. You make good use of the comfort as a place for the mind to settle in and be really solidly here, alert, 
watchful, ready to see any disturbance, any distraction that may come up, and not get waylaid by it. It's in this way that you can use the concentration to watch your own mind. This is the pattern that the, the Buddha set in his own quest for awakening. When he talked about it, he, was, he described it as the quest for what is skillful. When he left home, he left in quest of what is skillful. When he was disappointed with the teachings that he had at that time, he left the teachers in quest of what is skillful. When he gave up on his austerities, he continued in his quest of what is skillful. Sat down finally on, under the Bodhi tree, got the mind into concentration, and then used that concentration. This is where his teachings deviated from what he had learned from other people. Other people said, you get the mind into concentration, that's as good as it gets. His question is, what do you use it for? What's the best thing to use it for? So he investigated the question of birth and death. And he saw that death is followed by more birth, again and again and again. And the births go up, the births go down. Now, there were people in his time who had attained that knowledge and set themselves up as teachers, but he realized that wasn't the most skillful use of that knowledge. And the question was, why do people go up and down like that. And he saw that all beings, once they die, are reborn in line with their karma. The intentions they acted on, the views they held, that informed those intentions. And again, there were people who had knowledge like this, who had set themselves up as teachers. But he realized that this knowledge, too, didn't put an end to suffering. How can he use this knowledge to put an end to suffering? So he focused on the intentions. He focused on the views. What intentions, what views now would help put an end to suffering, help put an end to the cycle of birth and death? That's how he discovered the Four Noble Truths. He followed the duties with regard to those truths and gained awakening. That was the point where he didn't have to use his awakening for anything further. But up to that point, everything he found in his practice, he didn't just rest content with it. He asked himself, what is the most skillful use of this? It's that question that helps develop your discernment in all aspects of discernment. In other words, understanding things, but also being wise in how you use what you've got. Not mistaking means for ends. So right now we're focused on the breath. Not because we want to get the breath, although by focusing on the breath you find that you can breathe in ways that are really satisfying with the body. Settling for the mind. Because you want to get the mind. And once you've got the mind, then you want to put it to work. You want to learn how to delight in all of this. That's what keeps this practice noble. Delight in developing what's good, what's skillful. Delight in abandoning what's unskillful. We go around, as the Buddha said, with craving as our companion. We've got to realize that we've been hanging out with false friends, and it's time that we ended those friendships. And took the noble ones as our friends, and took the noble ones as our examples. So we follow their customs. We honor them, and we do honor to ourselves, to our own desire for true happiness. 
as I like to say in the forest tradition, when you're practicing the Dharma, you're also looking after yourself. In the Thai language, it's a pun. Word for practice and word for looking after, the same word. When the Buddha taught the Dharma, it wasn't because it was his Dharma, it was because the, it was the Dharma. He made it his own for the sake of his own practice, and now he offers it to us so we can make it ours for the sake of our practice. But we have to train ourselves so that we're worthy of it, lift ourselves to the Dharma. There are people who want to change the Dharma to fit in with their, their personal ideas of what they like. What they claim our culture teaches us has to be true. But if you base everything on your sense of who you are and what you like, or your sense of the world out there, you're basing everything on becoming. And as the Buddha said, that's the kind of craving that leads to more and more suffering. So give the Dharma a chance. See if you can ennoble yourself by following the the customs and the noble ones. Is it there for everyone to follow?